Hey students, this is Professor Gore, and um, in this part uh, of this recorded lecture, we're going to be covering World War One, which is one of my favorite topics to cover, uh, both teaching in, in world history and in U.S. And so, uh, like the previous lectures, we're going to divide this up into three parts. The first part will be covering uh, the cause of World War I um, with Europe and then kind of what happens with technology and so forth. Part two, we'll talk about the causes of the U.S. entry into World War I and uh, what happens during that time. And then in part three, we'll talk about um, the U.S. involvement of World War I, both uh, on the battlefield and on the home front. So uh, part three will be especially important um, for this, for tests and quizzes and so forth. Um, so World War I was actually called the Great War um, until World War II. Um, it was the greatest war the world had ever seen. It was the <clears throat> deadliest war the world had ever seen, um, other than only the Taiping Rebellion in China could rival it until World War II. And so um, it is a terrible war. And in my opinion, I think it's probably the dumbest war ever fought because uh, the causes of it and then um, the effects of it, it, it leads to World War II, which was actually worse. So um, and it, it, if I had to go back in time and fight into a, a fight in a conflict, World War I would be the last one I would pick. Um, so 60 nations are going to be involved um, on six different continents. That does that mean that everybody's all 60 nations are fighting and so forth? No, but. Um, it, it, it truly was a, a world war. Now, I would argue that the Seven Years War um, or the French Indian War, as we call it in the United States, uh, was a was a first world war in history. But um, this was far larger and far more deadly than that one. Uh, this is all estimated numbers, but um, the cost was about four hundred billion dollars total for all nations. Uh, that's ten million dollars an hour um, at, at different times of the war. Um, and, and here's the deal. It's difficult to, to calculate the total deaths from World War I. Some estimates you'll say 10 million. Some you'll see as many as 16 million um, because some died years after the war from the wounds they uh, suffered during the war. Um, so does that does that count as wartime deaths, uh, even though it occurred after the war? Um, you also have to consider the uh, Spanish flu outbreak because of World War I. The Spanish flu outbreak was far worse than it would have been um, um, at a different time in history that wasn't war related because you have a, a close proximity of soldiers, you have unsanitary conditions, weakened immune systems that, that make it much worse. So anyway, 10 to 16 million deaths estimated, depending on what you what you count. Um, it is the really the first major war in the Industrial Revolution. Yes, there were other wars before this, the Crimean War. Uh, the American Civil War, uh, the Franco-Prussian War in the 1870s, um, the colonial conflicts um, and so forth in the late 200s, early 1900s. But really, in terms of industrial nations at a wide scale, it really is the first major war of the Industrial Revolution. And of course, World War II is going to put this one to shame. And you're going to have these incredible new weapons. But the problem is, is a lot of the same old tactics of fighting. Now, World War II is going to change. You're going to have new weapons, but new tactics in fighting and so forth. Um, so we're going to talk about um, the central powers and the triple entente, or oftentimes called the allied powers. Um, all these different stars show where there were major conflicts that emerged. Um, but you, I want to show you this from kind of a, a global map perspective. You see uh, conflicts off the coast of South America. Um, you see colonies in Africa that had conflicts uh, where the British and the Germans are going to be uh, duking it out with their colonial armies. Um, where they would hire uh, locals to fight. Um, you see conflicts out in the Pacific. Japan is going to see some of German colonies out in the Pacific Ocean during World War I. Um, you see conflicts in the Middle East. You see conflicts in Eastern Europe and Russia and around the Black Sea and so forth. Um, so it really was a global war, um, so to speak. Now, those new types of weapons, uh, particularly this is what's called a howitzer gun. Um, so if you know anything about firearms, um, it was breech loading. So instead of the old school cannons where you would load them at the muzzle, so at the front of the gun, and then jam it back in there with powder, and then you would uh, uh, light it at the bottom and, and explode. But the howitzer, um, what it did is, is when it fired, the breech would come down by where those men are standing um, on their side of that wheel, and you could load a shell in really quickly. So you could fire much more rapidly than and pass and shells because the Industrial Revolution could be mass produced more so than cannonballs had been in the 1800s. Also, they could shoot further and have greater accuracy. So um, a lot of ways I've heard military historians call World War I really a war of artillery. 
um, and so forth. And because our artillery was heavily used. Um, and that's actually what led to a lot of uh, soldiers during the war uh, acquiring shell shock. Um, today we call it PTSD, but uh, shell shock was a little bit different because you would see men that would be shaking and, and because of the shelling and so forth. But it was World War One's version of PTSD, and it, it was terrible. Uh, men could be treated for it, certainly, just like men could be treated for PTSD today, but uh, or women as well that serve in combat. So, uh, but... Um, the howitzer was was a very deadly, potent weapon. Uh, this is a, a what they called the Big Bertha. Uh, also, uh, this is a German gun. Uh, we call it the I call it the Widowmaker because it made widows of uh, 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 men. Um, you see right here the the airplane, which uh, was invented by the Wright brothers and Glenn Curtis, in the, around the turn of the century, um, just a decade or so in is going to be outfitted with machine guns and use an aerial combat. Now, um, and the Air Force uh, and, and aircraft are not going to be as influential as they're going to be in World War II. Uh, World War II with artillery uh, or uh, air barrages and so forth um, were much more uh, potent. And one of the reasons why uh, the Allies do, do well in World War II is because of air supremacy. Uh, but the crazy thing is they were able to time the propeller blades that uh, the machine gun could shoot through the propeller without actually hitting it. Um, it was used for reconnaissance. They did have a few small bombs. They could blow up uh, military factory installations. Um, and there was some famous air dog fighting and so forth. Um, and it's fascinating uh, with World War I. And really, uh, the pilot's skill was the greatest, um, had a greater impact than even, say, in later wars, just because of the technology, because they flew pretty, pretty slow. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they're not going to play as pivotal of a role as they do in World War II. Submarines, first time that uh, submarines are going to be used uh, is World War I. The Germans use it very, very effectively, and it's because of unrestricted submarine warfare that the United States is going to enter into World War I. Um, but it was um, um, very much a stealthy way to uh, destroy shipping, and um, really getting supplies and shipping is so vital to both sides during World War One, and really what, what weakens Germany, and, and so I've heard some military historians claim that's what led to Germany's downfall is the British naval blockade and the, the, the inability of the German Navy to break through it that caused such problems um, for their, for their, and led to the decline of the morale by the end of the war. Uh, tanks, tanks really come about in 1918. Uh, they were slow and, and not that great, but they were just helping the allies turn the tide of the war um, in the last year to six months. Um, <clears throat> World War II is where tanks are going to be such a, a tremendously pivotal part of the war. But World War I, they are going to help break some of the stalemate in the trenches at the end in the last year of the war. Here's a British tank at the time, slow moving and so forth. Um, what was crazy about the design, you can't tell from this image, but the exhaust for the engine came out right by where the air ventilation shaft was. So that's one of the dumbest designs of world history. Um, because the men inside the tank would be breathing in that carbon dioxide air and a lot of them would get sick or even die in the tank because the carbon dioxide poison was terrible. So um, World War I is um, uh, famous or infamous, depending on your perspective, for trenches. And so um, it's because of the invention of the machine gun that forces armies to dig in to avoid just getting shot to pieces. Um, and it, it, uh, the war is going to be a stalemate on the Western front. Um, on the Eastern front, it is more fluid, but still relatively a stalemate, but uh, much more mobile front than the Western front. And, and the, the Eastern front's a bloodbath, just like the Western front, but in a different way. And so the, uh, the trenches, after the, the first few months of the war, um, both sides are going to dig in after the Germans retreated after the first Battle of the Marne River. And um, you're going to have trench warfare all the way until the end of the war. And uh, you, you can see right here that you had a front trench. You had a communication trench, a way to get troops up to the front. And then you had different reserve trenches. And you would have thousands of lives lost just to capture a few hundred yards. Uh, the front lines rarely moved with the exception of a few uh, times during uh, the war on the Western Front more than um, a couple miles uh, it's crazy how many people died just for yards. Now, no man's land was the land in between the uh, both sides. And, um, you know, originally there'd be forest in between them. And then by the time the artillery shelling, you know, you'd have a barren landscape. 
uh, no man's land was hell on earth. So let me kind of uh, explain to you what it looked like. So I'm going to show you a map in just a minute. Um, but when the Germans initial offensive uh, that began World War One uh, in 1914, uh, they were very, very close to being successful in the war in less than six months. Uh, but they were driven back at the first battle of the Marne River. Um, they kind of overextended their lines. When the Germans retreated, they retreated uh, back to kind of regroup and they retreated into Belgium and, to, and France. And they kind of took some higher ground and they dug in with their trenches and were like, all right, Britain and France, come dislodge us. Um, so the British and the French come up and they're a little bit, their trenches are a little bit lower lying areas at times and their trenches tend to flood more. Uh, but they dig in and uh, both sides dug in and no man's land um, would have um, shell holes everywhere, shrapnel, uh, uh, metal casings and so forth. It was a broken leg, broken ankle, sprained ankle. Um, cut up legs, what had to happen. Plus they put barbed wire all throughout there. So um, one of the reasons why they would do such a heavy artillery barrage before they would attack is they're hoping the artillery could blow up a lot of the barbed wire. But oftentimes you'd have men that would get stuck in the barbed wire trying to cut it and the machine guns would just mow them down. So, um, and it was called going over the top when you were ordered to attack across no man's land. Uh, and it was, it was God awful. Um, this is a shallow trench right here. And also in 1915, the Germans were the first ones to use mustard gas. Um, mustard gas um, blinds you uh, temporarily and at times permanently. In fact, Adolf Hitler was uh, hit with mustard gas uh, and was recovering in a hospital when, when the armistice was signed in 1918. But uh, um, they, uh, it also, you have trouble breathing and so forth. It can kill you, but really it disables you. And the Germans first used it to try to break through the British lines in 1915. And then, and then both sides used it in different gas and so forth. Uh, later, poison gas gets outlawed at the Geneva Convention. Also, um, these uh, blimps, these, the German Zeppelin, which was famous, would fly over and drop bombs. You'd also have uh, planes that would be designed to protect it. You'd have machine gunners on the top of it and at the bottom of it. I would not want to have flown on that back in the day. Flamethrowers, um, first war that flamethrowers were used, um, and it was a very effective weapon when you got up close in the trenches. Um, it would shoot out uh, flame gas, um, and they use it again during World War II especially. You see it to, to uh, attack fortified positions. If you've ever seen any World War II movies like Saving Private Ryan or Hacksaw Ridge or something like that. Uh, grenade launchers were also first used in World War I and, and are effectively used in World War II as well. And then later you see bazookas and... Uh, rocket launchers and so poison gas was was terrible um, and what was sad is is that you know the gas would accumulate in low-lying areas well that would be where you were in the trenches so you had to get to the high ground where you could take your mask off where you leave yourself open to getting shot um, the machine gun though is really what drove both sides into the trenches uh, and the Maxim machine gun which had a water-cooled barrel um, really just could just mow down people like grass. These are not all the leaders of World War I. These are just some. So the uh, guy on the top left is Franz Ferdinand, the um, uh, Archduke of Austria-Hungary who ends up getting uh, assassinated that, that helps cause World War I. Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, uh, President Wilson um, of the United States, Tsar Nicholas, um, the Russian Tsar who ends up getting executed with the Bolshevik Revolution, General John J. Pershing, commands the American forces. Uh, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge is going to be the guy who helps push the uh, Treaty of Versailles to be uh, uh, altered and voted down. Um, so when I taught um, high school in Texas, we had to know Alvin York for the uh, Texas Star Test. And so um, he was a Medal of Honor recipient and most decorated soldier for the United States during World War uh, I. Eddie Rickenbacker was a famous race car driver before World War I that became a America's most famous pilot. The, really, the greatest pilot of the war was Baron uh, Manfred von Richthofen, which we call him the Great Baron, which uh, or Red Baron, I'm sorry. Um, if you remember, had Red Baron Pizza, it's named after him. Uh, Vladimir Lenin, that's a, a spelling on his name there, but he is the leader of the Bolshevik Revolution. So let's look at uh, the causes of World War I. Now, I always tell students, that you remember it from the acronym of MANIA. Militarism, okay, um, alliances, nationalism, imperialism, and then the last day is assassination. 
So um, let's look at nationalism first. And so uh, all these different European countries are going to be involved. We're, we're having tremendous patriotism. They believe that their country was superior and they wanted to grow a very powerful, strong nation. And so particularly German nationalism was growing big. Uh, but British and French nationalism was equally uh, as patriotic as well. But, but particularly the German leaders wanted to create this Germany to become the most powerful nation in the world, where uh, after uh, Napoleon's defeat in 1815, the European powers wanted a balance of power and they didn't want Germany to become too, too powerful. Okay. This is a political cartoon of the day where Russia is trying to gobble up everything and the, and the Germans and austria hungarians are trying to keep them at bay. This is a pro-German uh, political cartoon. Um, so let's look at what actually leads to the, the, uh, the spark that caused World War I. So, um, so nationalism is, is with patriotism, okay? Mania with the M is militarism. Both sides built up tremendous amount of weaponry. I'm gonna show you a slide of that in just a second. Um, alliances, Russia to counterbalance um, um, Germany had created an alliance with France in years before. Britain had an alliance with Belgium. Okay, now Belgium's gonna get attacked by the Germans and there was a neutral nation that would bring Britain into war. Um, but uh, Germany's ally was Austria, Hungary and Italy. Now Italy eventually abandoned the alliance and eventually joined with the British and the French and the Russians. But uh, the years before the war, they were part of uh, an alliance with Austria, Hungary and um, Germany. The main reason why that they break off is they had some border disputes with Austria, Hungary and they ended up fighting them on the Italian front during World War I. Um, now, in the Balkans, which is southeastern Europe, um, their, um, Austria Hungary had seized quite a bit of territory in the previous century that the Ottoman Empire had once held. The Ottoman Empire was this very powerful um, empire in uh, the Middle East and southeastern Europe and North Africa um, and controlled parts of the Mediterranean Sea at one time. Well, in the 1800s, a lot of different places in southeastern Europe rebelled against the Ottomans and gained their freedom particularly Serbia and, and uh, uh, Greece and others. And so Austria-Hungary, um, which was the old Habsburg Empire, seized a lot of that territory. And particularly some areas they seized were, uh, had ethnic Serbians living in it. And so Serbia, a small nation in Southeastern Europe, was, was very angered by this. And they kind of developed this radical group, um, um, this, uh, this Shining Path group or whatever, and um, they would, um, it was kind of secretly led by some military personnel, military officers of the Serbian army. Well, one guy that would became caught up with the Serbian nationalism is a young uh, man by the name of Garvilio Princep. And um, he had been training for three or four years to shoot. Uh, he was a terrible shot. Um, he could, it's, it's crazy that he actually killed the Archduke and his wife. Uh, if he wasn't at point blank range, he wouldn't have. Uh, but he, he wasn't a very good shot, and he was part of assassination a plot to try to kill members of the royal family. Now, the uh, uh, leader of Austria-Hungary, the king, his son was dispatched to um, um, kind of the Bosnia-Herzegovina area uh, today to uh, 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 kind of deal with some ethnic problems that were happening because Austria-Hungary ruled over a variety of different ethnic groups, and none of them were too happy about being ruled by the Austrian-Hungarians. Um, and so they tried to assassinate him as he was driving in an open car, like a convertible, um, as he was driving to um, a government building. And um, Garvilio was part of the group, but didn't actually fire the first shot. Um, they they fired and they, they ended up wounding a, a bystander uh, for the art, uh, that was watching the Archduke. And the um, couple of people were, were apprehended. Garvilio was able to escape into the crowd. Now, um, what, what ends up happening is the Archduke, instead of ev evacuating the city, ends up uh, going about his business and then decides when he leaves the government building that he wants to go by the hospital and visit the bystander who was wounded uh, with the assassination plot, which is very nice of him. Garvilio is sitting in a local uh, cafe sulking because they have failed at their mission of killing the Archduke. Well, as he's sitting there, he sees the, the Archduke's uh, car drive by. Now, the, the driver had actually taken a wrong turn, and so Garvilio hopped up, ran out the back, and uh, because the, the driver had taken, out, um, taken a wrong turn, he actually drove down the road where Garvilio was. And as he drove by, he was basically at point-blank range. Garvilio fires several shots. He kills the Archduke uh, and then also kills his pregnant wife. Uh, and so um, 
uh, the, uh, there's a couple of things the Archduke says his last words, which one I found amusing, the other one is tragic. Where um, when when he gets shot in the neck, he's like, I think I've been shot. Well, duh, you got shot. Uh, and then uh, when his wife is dying there in his arms, he says, don't die on me, my love. Uh, and so both of them end up dying at the hospital. And um, they also lost their child as well. And so Garfilio is apprehended. And um, it, it's going to kind of set this spark that's going to start World War I. So um, Sarajevo was the area where um, the city where he was killed. But um, you look at Germany, Austria, Hungary, later Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire are going to join with the Central Powers. Russia, France, and, and then Great Britain and Belgium are going to be part of the, the, the Allied powers. So if you look right here, Austria, Hungary, look at the different ethnic groups that are a part of that. And so um, you look at there was quite a bit of ethnic Serbs um, or Cro Croatians and Serbs that were living in the southern part of Austria, Hungary, and they weren't too happy. So pr primarily who dominated the government were the Austrians, which are German, and then the uh, Hungarians or the Magyars. And so forth. So let's look at imperialism. Both France, Great Britain, Germany, and Russia were establishing colonies uh, in Africa and Asia. Now, Russia wasn't in Africa, but they were definitely in Asia and, um, and so forth. And so it was a major competition who's going to carve up these different colonies. They, they had economic control, sometimes they had political control, but sometimes they would rule indirectly by, by local um, and so forth. And th these countries were competition. They were trying to one up each other. That's one of the causes and underlying um, things of World War One. This political cartoon is talking about them grab, gra uh, grabbing up as many uh, colonies as they could get and so forth. So you look at colonial claims by 1900. A most of Africa is, is carved up. Only Liberia and Ethiopia are, are still independent. Um, you look at parts of the Middle uh, Well, Middle East is still controlled by the Ottomans. And um, you look at uh, um, uh, Southeast Asia um, and parts of Oceania are carved up and so forth. China, even though they're not ruled politically, they they're have spheres of influence where they have an economic monopolies over those areas. Militarism, I want to show you some stats here to help you understand the military buildup right before World War I. And so look at the amount of soldiers mobilized. Russia mobilized the most, about 12 million. Germany mobilized about 11 million. Um, but let's look at this. And so between 1910 and 1914, uh, how much of the country's federal budget was going to defense expenditures? Germany spent 73% of its budget on military expenditures. Do you think they were preparing for war? Yes. Okay. Now, all the countries that are involved in this are, um, are responsible for World War I, but Germany definitely shares a good chunk of the blame. So they, the war begins in September of 1914. And so let me kind of... Uh, show you a map here to kind of explain what happens. You have these alliances that are taking place. The, the central powers of Germany, Austria, Hungary, and then later in 1915, Bulgaria joins as well as the Ottoman Empire. The Triple Entente, also called the Allied Powers, is Great Britain, France, and Russia, along with Belgium, but Belgium wasn't uh, as major of a power. So what ends up happening is Austria, Hungary um, had alliance with, with Germany. And it's because of this alliance that, that kind of gets the ball rolling. They're, when, when the Archduke is killed, um, they're livid at the Serbians. And um, Serbia um, ally is happens to be Russia. Russia is pushing for a pan-Slavic uh, movement to try to unite the Slavic ethnic uh, groups of Eastern Europe. And so Austria-Hungary puts these ridiculous demands, like they have to pay a bunch of money and do this and do that. Well, Serbia actually was willing to meet just about all of them. That didn't matter. Germany had told Austria Hungary, if you if you want to go to war, let's go ahead and settle this this, this crisis in the Balkans now. Now, um, Russia had told Austria Hungary, if you attack Serbia, we're going to attack you. And then Germany knew that if, if Russia attacked, then they would have to defend them. And then if Russia was attacked, then France would have to defend them. So um, what's interesting is that the Kaiser of Germany and the Tsar of Russia were actually cousins, and they would send telegraph back and forth using their nicknames like. Hey, Nikki, you're not going to, or Nick, you're not going to actually do something, are you? And, he, you know, and Willie, you're not going to actually do this and do that. And really, it could have been stopped if both would have, if, if both sides just would have taken a deep breath and said, all right, how can we solve this without violence? It could have easily been taken care of. But instead, it's not. And war was on the way. Germany feared that Austria Hungary was weakening. If they were going to fight a war against Russia and France in order to win, they need to fight it sooner than later. Now, that was the German Kaiser's mentality. Okay. And so um, 
Germany knows that they cannot afford to fight a two front war. And so they knew it was going to take Russia a while to mobilize. And so really what starts it is once countries started mobilizing their their troops there, it's on a timetable with the railroads. And once you start mobilizing troops to the front, it's kind of like a, a freight train. Once it gets going, it's really difficult to stop. And uh, where Russia was started mobilizing, and then Germans started mobilizing, and France started mobilizing, Austria Hungary was already mobilized. It, it, it's a big old mess. So Germany is going to try in their attempt to knock out France first. Okay, they thought France was the weaker of, of the two, and then turn around and fight Russia with two two arms free because Russia had had the greater military might at the time. Um, and so their plan is going to backfire at this at the battle of the, of the first uh, first battle of the Marne River. So France had had. Uh, create these defenses right there uh, on their German border. Germany had, or at least Prussia had invaded, which was east part of Germany in the 1870s, invaded France and whooped them in a few weeks, but they had gone through the German French border. France had been humiliated. It was one of the great shames of their nation's history. And so they wanted to prevent that. So they were heavily fortified on that area. Well, Germany felt like that they had to win and capture Paris within 60 days. If they don't capture Paris within 60 days, they're screwed in order to fight Russia. So they decide the only way they can do is go through Belgium. Belgium was a neutral nation, happened to be allied with Great Britain, which is why Great Britain enters the war. Well, when they, the Germans invade Belgium, uh, some terrible god awful atrocities take place. Um, the Germans, because they're on the 60 day timetable, um, would any, any civilian they saw that might resist, they would execute them. Um, women were raped as well. Um, now, does that mean every German soldier was just that? No. Um, but American journalists that were there covering the story who did not favor the U.S. involvement, after they see how the Belgians were treated, they couldn't help but say that the United States has a moral duty to uh, stop Germany from doing this again. And so um, it's terrible what happens to civilians. Uh, Belgium is a, little, is, is a scrappy country and, and puts up a better fight than Germany anticipates. Um, as they cross into France, uh, the French are, are not prepared. Um, the, the British have sent over division. Um, now at this point, and they're driven back. The Germans push the the French to the to the east, and the Germans to uh, the, the the British to the west, and um, they left a kind of a big big gaping hole at the Marne River. And the French sent a reserve division up the middle, and they uh, open up um, um, kind of a hole in the German lines. The Germans had overextend themselves. The Germans are like, oh crap. And then they retreat and they dig into uh, Belgium and France. And both sides tried to flank each other at one point. And that's why they dig the trenches all the way down to Switzerland and all the way up to uh, the ocean. And that's where you're going to have the Western Front. Um, and you can see where the lines are and so forth. Um, and the armistice line is, is the furthest line to the right. Um, the... Um, Far line to the left is the, the line of, of, of Germans' furthest advance uh, in 1917, 1918. We'll talk about that later when the United States enters the war. But the middle line is kind of where the, the Western Front was at uh, for most of the war. This is a political cartoon. Uh, it's showing the Germans, this mean, crockety old man with sausage hanging out his, his pants uh, or, or coat pocket. And then Belgium is this young child who's scrappy and fighting. And so forth. This is a pro uh, allies um, cartoon. And so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop there for part one and I'm going to come back to actually what's going to happen on the Western Front before the U.S. intervenes and then what causes the U.S. to intervene in World War One uh, in part two.